I, I want to introduce myself. I'm Karen Kohler. I'm a professor of architectural and art history at Hampshire College. This is my colleague, Jocelyn Edens, who is a Christ Curatorial Fellow at the college. Um, my teaching partner, Jennifer Bjorek, uh, is in comparative literature, but she's not, uh, wasn't able to be here with us today. So um, for those of you who don't know, Hampshire College is an experimental college, no grades, no conventional majors, uh, but we are part of the five college consortium with Amherst, Mount Holyoke, Smith, and the University of Massachusetts. And this project uh, came out of a blended learning grant from the Teagle Foundation through Five Colleges Incorporated, which is our consortial body. Um, we um, use two platforms in this class. Uh, reading, uh, we use Scalar and Moodle. Um, and I'm going to talk about those a bit more in a minute um, about how the class used Scalar particularly. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the origins of the class. And that's the idea of slow teaching um, and how slow teaching uh, is meant to push back against the skim and the glance of online viewing. Um, and I want to begin by reviewing this essay by uh, Jennifer Roberts. You should read it yourself, but I'm going to review it very, very quickly. Um, the Power of Patience. Now, for Roberts, uh, she teaches with the premise that just because we looked at something doesn't mean that we actually see it. And that um, it doesn't mean that you've taken the time to really engage with an image or an object or even a text. So when the questions she asks are, when will students learn quickly? When will they learn slowly? When will they work quickly or slowly? When will they work in a spontaneous fashion? And when after more contemplation? She wants to give students, and I would add to this ourselves as technologists and as uh, teachers, when do we give ourselves the permission to slow down? Uh, her mission is to have us slow down, and so her courses uh, are, and she teaches at Harvard, this is part of a, a paper that she gave um, to a teaching conference at Harvard. The course, her courses are premised on this idea that uh, deceleration is a good thing, and particularly when every external pressure, both social and technological, moves us into the opposite direction. So um, she did this unbelievably cool project with her students where they studied the um, image here that you see here in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts uh, by Copley, uh, the boy with the squirrel. And she tells the story that she has every one of her, every one of her students do an extended research paper Throughout, yeah, throughout the course of the uh, semester, and that they have to sit with the object for three hours that they're going to be working on. And um, for three full hours. And she says that she has a tremendous amount of resistance from the students uh, to have them do this because what's our assumption? That vision is immediate. Right? That vision is uncomplicated. We see something and we've absorbed it or we've, we've consumed it. Um, and so she points out how she herself spent, I think, 11 hours maybe with this object. And she found things much later. This is the lights are making it a little hard to see here, but that the shape of the, the boy's eye is the same as this shape here that the width, of his, the width of his fingers is exactly the same as the width across the glass, that the shape of his ear is echoed in the shape of the white spot on the squirrel. And that these are things that emerge only when you've spent time looking for an extended period of time. 
She also then moved into the research element of this idea of extended looking. Copley packed up this painting and sent it to London, asking uh, for a response from his former teachers in London. Uh, he was based at that point in, in Boston. And it, for the time that he packed it, put it on a boat, sent it across to London, it got unpacked, displayed. His friends uh, took people to look at it, hand wrote a letter, right? Put it in a boat, sent it back. It was 11 months before he got feedback on this uh, picture. So what they, and they said they liked it, but it was too liney. <laughs> but um, she also points out then that there was this process of the life of the painting and the critique of the painting that had a particular kind of duration attached to it. And then she went back in to look again at the painting and discovered that, what is this? This is hands and a chain across a body of water that this is a flying squirrel, not just a squirrel. So something uh, that's, that's only found in North America. That, um, uh, well, other things, I guess I would say, oh, I know, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, Copley rarely painted figures in profile. And where do you see figures in profile? On coins. And coins are, of course, systems of exchange across space and time. So not only did she read the image closely, she found ways to go back into the um, history uh, of the piece to tell these, these kinds of stories. So um, Jennifer and I and our team uh, thought that the idea of slow teaching, which implies that details and orders of things in images, and relationships that can be found between parts of images and between the image and its history takes time. That is not an instantaneous thing. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Did Jennifer find that her observations were, many of them were what the artist intended? Or were these? I, I think, well, first of all, we're conflating two Jennifers. I teach with Jennifer Bjork. This is the, the essay I talked about was Jennifer Roberts, who's at Harvard. That was the inspiration for our class, That's two great. Jennifers. Um, I think that your question is a really interesting one, but I'm going to hold it because I'm going to talk about artistic intention a little bit later, and I will specifically address this and that. I do think that there's over-reading if that's what you're getting at, I, just personally, in some of the things that she finds. Um, anyway, so we thought that this pedagogical uh, orientation that recognizes the challenges and distractions of our plugged-in world and the potential risks for too much dispersal of ideas and actions when teaching in a reactive way with technologies would be well-matched to teaching photography. Because we, we have to all recognize, as your comments suggested early on, that it is the digital world where most of our students encounter photography. Um, I actually did a session on the selfie. Um, but simultaneously, um, our approach intended to respond to the uh, changes in the way that we are interpreting and using photographs in digital formats and in digital environments. So slow teaching targets the purposeful development of mindfulness, both in and out of the classroom, uh, and is premised on the idea that student engagement can be increased through the development of a meaningful, deep, and extended focus, regardless of the subject of the course. The critical reading of, photo of photographs Using slow teaching is premised on the recognition that not only photographs, but our methods of engaging with, looking at, reading, citing, and collecting uh, photographs 
are changing in ways that have not been adequately addressed in the pedagogical environment. In other words, the incredible accumulation of photographs has not been dealt with in the classroom for those of us who teach the history of photography. For the class, we decided that we would concentrate on one photograph per class session. Now, as an art historian who usually shows 50 slides per class, this was an incredible learning curve for me uh, to concentrate on one photograph, with our main goal being to cultivate close critical looking and close reading skills <coughs> to see what kind of potential might be unlocked by this. And this means engaging with less material rather than more, but it also means that we will be digging deeper and with more analytical heft. The premise of the course then, one photograph per session. But I want to point out that it's not anti-technology, that it is a blended approach. Um, that can enable close looking and close reading when teaching about photography and that it can promote an advanced understanding of research methodologies. I think what, I, what we'll do is we'll walk through the Scalar site. Can we go to the, um, to the uh, Frederick Douglass site? Who is currently dead? <laughs> <laughs> so this is, we use this platform called Scalar, new to all of us, right? So that was just to point that out. But every photograph that we concentrated on had its own module, a research module that we built. The reason we like Scalar is that the image is there, big, dense, right? And you have the uh, capability of really um, highlighting the image. But then every module had primary sources, required critical readings, like for example, a primary source uh, being a uh, narrative of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. We liked Scalar because you could put the, um, the readings right in there. You didn't have to download a PDF and take them someplace else, but you could if you wanted to. We found that some, we did a technological survey, and we found that about out of 20 students, there were five that did not own personal computers at a liberal arts college, right? So a warning for always doing those kinds of surveys. And so we wanted to do something that would um, work well. So it back to this question of um, privilege, privileging process, Yes and no. I mean, we also um, um, felt like it, that we needed to supply really intense research materials for each and every object. So, and, and so every object has primary, critical, additional, other media texts or objects. Every student did uh, contributed something to a timeline which Scalar allows you to do. Um, and let me just move up a little. You can embed images. You can embed video. You can embed all kinds of sources right in here. And every student had to put something on the timeline for every photograph that we studied. Um, and it could be a, another work of art. It could be a text. It could be a video. It could be. Um, anything, a, a historical event, um, a political event, right? England to make arrangements uh, to purchase his freedom. So then we also, and this is the part I wish we were not uh, simultaneously with the Scalar site, because I would like to maybe talk about this a little bit. But we also um, had a second site which was our annotating site. I'm going to tell you how the students used all these in, in a little bit more chronological detail in just a second. But um, every week, students, after they studied the image, after they read the primary and the critical reading, the required readings, 
would have to annotate the image. So they would ask a question. Did we just see something else? They would ask a question about the image yeah, that came out of the readings that they were required to do. And those questions became the content that started out the following class. So um, how did we make this work, you might ask, in terms of workflow? Can we go back to the PowerPoint? OK, there we go. So um, on Wednesday, we would put an image up cold. They had never seen it before. Free writing about the image for 20 minutes. Then, and they had no prior knowledge of the photograph at that point unless they had looked ahead in Scala. We kind of asked them not to do that, and I think they mostly respected that. Um, then we would discuss their free writing, and then we, the professor, uh, myself, or Jennifer, would introduce the historical context. Then, before class, the following Monday, they would go in and read the primary, read the critical, and then do their annotations. And then we would begin each class with the questions that they had then attached to the photograph based upon the primary and critical reading. Then we would, the professors again, would offer alternative readings, expose different methodologies, talk about different research things, and then they would go back and study the additional materials which were links to sites about um, how you make a daguerreotype. How do you, so we used um, lots of existing scholarly websites, including simple things like Oxford Art Online and those kinds of things to help students build their knowledge about the photograph. And we loaded these research modules with all kinds of links and additional critical materials. Um, hopefully putting the works Seeing the work in the timeline helped them see a larger historical context. So um, we thought, um, in order to get you guys involved in taking part in this, that we would have you do an example of this free writing. Um, and we're going to use this photograph. And again, um, because we really wanted students to not be using their devices in the classroom, this took place on paper. So, and this is exactly what they look like. So, we'll take about 10 minutes um, and uh, we'll let you know when. So, all I'm asking you to do is look at the image, see as much as you can see to talk about, and um, um, we'll uh, come back and I will let you know when five minutes has passed and when two minutes are left. And just like um, the woman did who worked on the Copley, I'll ask you if you think about it, to, if I say five minutes to Mark, what did you notice at that point that you hadn't noticed earlier? Now, anticipating that the uh, lighting might not be so great, I want to show you just a detail of this part for a second, and then I'll go back to the full image. It says, we made you across the bottom. Okay. okay. So we'll stop there. Um, and it was really interesting to watch you to watch you write because um, 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 to watch you write because you kind of went through the same patterns that we watched in the from the class all semester. So they actually had 20 minutes to half an hour to write on the objects. Obviously, you're on the luxury of that quite this afternoon. Um, but um, that there would be first impressions that you wrote, and then looking, 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 you know, eyes up for a long time. Not necessarily everybody at the same time, but there would always be first impressions, and then later thoughts, and then another extended period of looking, and then more thoughts. Um, it's also really um, interesting to have a classroom be that quiet. 
and I'm that quiet for that long, it feels uncomfortable, but also like a luxury to just sit and have the class be quiet and be every one of those emotions. So why don't we start by just having you tell me what some of the things are to tell each other. Once we get back up, what are some of the things that you saw? Hunger. Hunger. Uh huh. Right. Other things? I found myself focusing on the relationship in the first school of my writing, like it's like a mother and a child, or um, and the way we have to say it's going into our kind of relationship that we have Others? The greeniness of the photograph. Right. There was almost like an underlying texture to it that suggested maybe printed in newsprint or uh -huh. tone or something like that. Uh -huh. Also, the photographer was at eye level and used a shallow depth of field to sort of suggest wanting us to focus on the figures uh -huh. and to give us engagement with them as subjects because of eye contact. Right. And also give them space in the image. Right. right. So um, a very particular position of the photographer now. Right. That in, then becomes our position. Yeah, it's sort of, I mean, at the five minute mark, I wrote down this looks like Rafael Lang's My Right Mother. Uh huh. You know, from the yeah. 1930s. Yeah. That sort of focus on, like, I want to give this person dignity and yeah. a chance just with eye contact and eye level. Mm -hmm. um, a chance to sort of show their presence and mm -hmm. something of their story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did everyone feel dignity looking at the figure? Can you have hunger and dignity at the same time? I saw, I, my first word was resignation. Resignation, uh -huh. in the mother's eyes. Yeah, and, and yeah. In, in someone in the child's position as well. They, they, there's a sense of comfort amongst each other, but an inability to deal with the source of the need for it. Right. There, there's also, I just also wanted to add that when I first saw the, the, the position of the, the child maybe it was just a baby, right? It was very small, very small. Yeah. But it's also very long. Mm -hmm. if you look at the legs and the arms, it's, a, it's not an infant, it's a child. And it's, right. a, it's a very small, frail child. Small, frail child, going back again to the idea of hunger. Yeah. Um, comparison to um, Dorothea Lange is, is often made uh, with this photograph, um, as is um, comparison to the history of images of Madonna and child. The question of what is, um, what is the woman's expression is something that it seems to vary tremendously. Does she have dignity? Is she resigned? Is she just like staring out into nowhere, right? Is she numb? Um, which is how I read it, but not necessarily how I would expect everyone to read it. So uh, while we're doing this, I'll try to tell you a little bit about the picture and chime in, um, Jocelyn, if I forget anything, because I can't see my notes on my computer. So, um, that's totally fine. Um, um, this is a photograph by, made by a performance artist and conceptual artist, Adrian Piper. Adrian Piper bought the rights to this photograph, uh, which was um, a journalistic photograph of a woman and a child in a refugee camp in Somalia. She took this small image from the newspaper, blew it up, in a silkscreen fashion, and silkscreen the words, we made you, across the bottom. Um, what was the photographer? It's the original photographer's name. I can't remember. Um, uh, Turley, Peter Turley. And he, um, <laughs> um, and, but I always forget him, because I always write it on the slide. Um, Peter Turley, and um, um, he relinquished all rights to this. We had a team of students looking in a different project, looking to find the original photograph published somewhere we never found it. Um, I, I don't know that it exists in anything but print copy, and I believe it was published in an Italian newspaper. Um, and the work 
um, is actually quite large um, for a journalistic photograph. So that graininess that you see comes from the original, but also appears in uh, the silk screen quite intentionally. Right? You can each circle is like almost this big. I'll show you if we ever get the size of that. But the um, um, so it has this really loaded history. This object that these are refugees in a Somalian camp, but that this is an appropriated photograph, right? This is appropriation art. She's taken somebody else's work and reused it and made an object that is now in the collection of the Montpellier Art Museum. And um, so, and it comes with a contract actually about how often and where the image can be used. Just why I was a little hesitant on being uh, taped, but um, <laughs> so we're probably in violation of the contract. So it's a good thing that well, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. So other comments that occur to you now that you know a little bit more about it, things that are related maybe to what you saw. Yeah, but. I consciously avoided the addition of the text to it until, uh, until the very end. I uh -huh. didn't want to deal with that because I thought it was too, it was too much like um, uh, intellectual bait. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I tried to avoid that, but once I did, then I started really questioning who's who's speaking, right? Who's the we? Is it the person in the is the is the woman and child who are the we? Is it us right. who's the we? Is it the artist that made this who's the we? Right. And I couldn't decide on that. So that made me just think about the words, what they mean, and they made me think about Macrit in the sense that that's oh. a false claim. Right. Right. No yeah. one who's in here has made anyone. Uh huh. Right. So it's yeah, that's great. Um, and we we use those words a lot in our analysis of this image. So I'm just going to show you some, oh, this is um, um, some, um, the other side. Oh, you got it? Okay. Um, so uh, silk screen photograph, Mount Holyoke College. This is some of the um, metadata that we have on the Scalar site. It allows you to put all that kind of detailed information. This is just a screenshot. There's actually about three times as much uh, of the metadata. Who made the actual digital image that I'm borrowing from, which comes from the Black College Museum database. Um, this was one occasion where we actually took the students into the museum to look at the object for their free writing. Um, the five college museums are connected by a bus. We're 10 minutes away in Hampshire, so we hopped on the bus and the museum staff pulled the object out for us and put it in the context of a large photo, photo show that they were having, having. So here you see them doing their um, free write. The reason it was so important to me that they see the image, this one image in person, is because the image is actually uh, framed behind super reflective glass intentionally. So when you stand in front of it, you see your own face reflected into the image. So suddenly that idea of who made who and the layers of interactivity that that uh, intellectual bait invites us into um, is very much present. The image is very performative uh, for, um, and that's of course quite intentional and also I love when they put it on this rolling easel and you know, we take it around the museum and look at it for other things. Okay. That suggests the, one of the problems of photography is really an image right. of an object right. and seen it in person. Right. Ooh, if we missed that entire layer, right. by seeing it here. Right, we exactly. It we don't get to see it here. and But it also, then the question of what is the original photograph? Is right. it, is it, version of it. right? It's, Who's appropriating who and what's appropriating what is all completely fascinating with this image. Um, and the layers are, they're just almost like endless. And as I said, this is, of course, completely uh, intentional. Okay. 
So I want to tell you a little bit more about Adrian Piper, and of course in class um, I would spend much more time on this, but in order to understand what her intentions are, and then we'll start to talk about uh, that quite that problem that we have of authorial intention. Um, so Adrian Piper, she lives in Berlin now. Um, she taught at Wellesley College for a long time. She was the first. I believe, tenured female professor in philosophy uh, in the country back when tenured, tenured female faculty person of color uh, in the United States. Um, and I wanted to show you just real quickly, we'll try the video and see what happens. Um, live dangerously here. <laughs> so. Well, the piece that I'm working on now came very much out of what this I had in internal expectations for success in the audience to say. The idea is very much to see what would happen if there was a being who had exactly my history, only a completely different visual appearance to the rest of society. And that's, that's why I dressed as a man. And I find that when I put on the garb, it somehow it transforms the nature of the experiences that I'm thinking about. Okay, so she dresses up um, in this garb, walks down the streets of New York, reciting her journal. This is one of her performance art pieces that she made back in the 80s. And um, it's important to know her background if we're going to actually go in and start reading the photograph as a piece of performance. Right? And the thing we loved about Scalar is that we could embed these videos right into the course website. Um, and again, there was no downloading, there was no going to other sites, it was all included right there. Um, Adrian Piper, though, um, doesn't like to be, as much as she performs her identity as a black person, she does not like to be isolated as a maker of um, uh, as an African American artist. So we talked about a little bit how she actually pulled out of the Black Performance Art Show at NYU um, not that long ago. We also took advantage of the fact that Fred Moten was speaking in Hampshire and he has written on Adrian Piper. So one of the readings that the students had was um, about was by Fred Moten, whose question is Who's looking at who? Right? Who are you looking at? At that kind of um, approach. But Adrian Piper is not just a visual artist, not just a performance artist. She is a philosopher. She is a professor of philosophy. And this is where I think uh, we kind of surprise the students by having them. Kant has this idea um, that we have a certain function in the brain that works in the following way. Data comes in through the senses as, we can just say, representations. You know, uh, color, texture, sound, shapes, just all sorts of stuff at any level of microcosm or macrocosm. Okay. So stuff comes in, and then we have to figure out how to organize it. Kant's idea is that there's something in the brain which enables us not merely to receive this data, but to distinguish its parts and arrange those parts in a linear order. 
so that datum number one comes in at time t1. And instead of simply forgetting it, you know, erasing it and going on to the next datum, we hold that in the mind while datum number two comes in at time t2. Okay? So we now have two data that have come in at different times. And the mind can compare datum one with datum two. Is it the same? Is it different? Does it have a different quality? Does it have new qualities? And then the same with data number three at time T3. And the same with data number four at time T4. Okay, so now at all of these moments, which really only become moments in view of the fact that there are these separate data, right? The data itself is held together, forming an ongoing so um, this was the kind of, um, again, a, a different kind of video that talked not about questions of race or identity, but about questions simply of how does time exist in uh, the field of philosophy. But if you think about the layers in that object, right, the object, the first, the people in the refugee camp, the photograph by uh, uh, the journalist, the printing of the photograph in the newspaper, the purchase of the rights to the photograph by Adrian Piper, the blowing up of the photograph, right? These are all, in a way, her uh, representations of her idea of T1, T2, T3. And so we can read questions of time and duration and layers of time back into the photograph itself. So, but our charge, our problem really, was what, how do we, how do we get students to combine these things? And so for this, every week we had a different, for every photograph we had a different assignment. Either a mapping assignment, a curatorial assignment, and we'll look at some of those uh, uh, near the end today, and also, um, or a written assignment. And for this, we asked the students to write an essay on what is your responsibility for this image? Who is making whom? And we did this because we really felt we had to move the question into this philosophical realm, but also allow the students to engage with questions of race and identity if they felt that that was what emerged for them out of the image. Um, I would say the responses were kind of mixed. But now one more little piece of background um, about this. And then I want to ask you guys for help with something. Which is how to move beyond formal analysis. Right? We loved the free writing model. It seemed to work really, really well. Students really liked it, they saw things, they engaged deeply, they contemplated the image in exactly the ways we hoped that they would. But the struggle was to get them to go anywhere else, right? to get them to use the research materials in ways that moved beyond formal analysis. And a lot of the annotations actually still stayed on, why is this shape here? or I like this shape here, or isn't he wearing nice clothes, right? So the, the, they never really moved into this kind of deep historical reading. In, well, not never, and of course it varied student to student, but um, that remained our challenge. The other part was um, beyond getting them to look at the properties of the image as evidence, of some larger philosophical or historical argument to not see the formal properties at an endpoint. But often, when they would go to the next step, it was always to the artist's intention, to authorial intention. And I don't mean to downplay the intention of the artist. In fact, I think it's a very significant piece of the historical analytic, but I think it can't be the end all, right? We can't overprivilege the maker. 
the author. And so that was, I mean, we it was, you know, I like to talk about it as if you build it, will they come, right? <laughs> if you build these uh, historically research-rich sites, but the image itself is prominent in the work that's being done, how do you move beyond formal analysis? So I'm open to ideas, yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question? You, you did all of the, um, the building of the Scalar site and yes. the selection? Until the end. Until the end? Yeah, when students build their own. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I, I wonder if the, the transformations yeah. of these objects and the practice of curation might encourage them to move beyond that kind of formal analysis? Right. Right, yeah, I mean, some of the assignments were curatorial, but it, even still they ended up being sort of, um, this picture looks nice next to this picture, as opposed to this picture next to this picture is making an argument about facts. Um, in the additional material that you provided, it sounds like a lot of it was about the artist and sort of the origin of the image and maybe some of the technological aspects that went into it. But did you also include sort of historical, like, yes, this was, yes, what, okay, all right. Um, the, the private, primary documents tended to favor the artist, right? Okay. They were statements by the artist or about the sitter, if it was a portrait. Um, the secondary, the required critical readings were always art historical analysis or historical analysis. And they were intended to represent different methodologies which is, I think, possibly where we got tripped up, right? That we just loaded a little bit too high of an expectation. Because you could also, like, in an image like this, for example, talk about the original photographer, the news events that were surrounding this, the way that it was represented in the news, you know, locally versus globally, um, or even from another perspective, like, how did Adrian Piper's work fit in with other performative work, or mm -hmm. how would, you know, um, who else could you relate this work to, and how did it differ, or whatever? Right, we did that to some extent, but probably not enough. And certainly, going back to the original Somali moment was not something we did. Okay, so I should have said we didn't we didn't teach together each one, but we each picked I think four photographs. So we had eight photographs all semester. So building on that, I wondered if you actually modeled that for so to to show them how you would have gone about. Oh yeah. Okay. oh yeah. Okay. So somehow that didn't, it didn't manifest right, right, for right. them to recognize that right. they could or right. should do right. what you were showing. Yeah. One other little piece of information I should have said before is that um, most of the students in the class are photography students. Right? Studio art students or filmmakers are, are photography students. Um, the few that were art historical, art history students or literature students um, had, did a better job of contextualizing. So I, I wonder whether, because um, we often talk about the artist as expressing something, just sort of this crutch to rely upon, even though we don't mean that the artist is actually yeah. uh, expressing something. So I wonder whether some of your responses were doing that thing where the student was in, is just sort of relying on the idea of the author as a an empty vessel yes. because they don't know what else to say. Right. You know what I mean? Right, right. Or themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Well, are you asking about sort of like recusing responsibility because one can actually know intentions? I, or, or like usually like when we when we read a piece of when we read a piece of art, we're usually saying, well we ought the we either say that we have to phrase it as saying that the piece is expressing this, or the author, or the, the composer, the author, the writer is expressing this, even though it's not exactly what we mean. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, right. right? I wonder whether right. the students are actually right. doing what you want them to do. Right. It's just they don't know how to how to right. say it. Right, right. They're not going back to the evidence in the image, which they were so great at finding, right, and which the slow learning allowed them to find really deep content, visual content. But then they they just couldn't go beyond this idea of intention. Can I can I follow up on what Chris just said? You make me remind me of like my first year in an art history PhD program in which we read Thomas Crowe's The Intelligence of Art, and I was blown away by a single phrase where he said, "All interpretation is a form of violent substitution." 
where we take one idea, the biography of the artist, and we get it so close to the artwork that it seems to explain it. Or, yeah. we, or we move away from that. We say, here are the historical circumstances. We get so close to that that they seem to explain each other. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just making that violence, uh, of making people aware of that violence, right. and I thought maybe performing that violence by saying, take the, take the perspective of a radically unkind uh, newspaper editor and use this photograph in a, an unkind way. Right? Or I mean, I, I'm just taking a radically a radical position on this, mm -hmm. but or or just or do it in a nicer way and say just figure out how to change this image into something that is very very different in meaning by painting the trees green or or cropping in a different way. And so in that sense, they take a, they they see the interpretive process and they also get away from the author because then they become the author in a sense as mm -hmm. well. And maybe, you know, once they have to sit down and say, I don't know, I just got this idea, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. I might piggyback on that a little bit, too. As a student looking at a picture that I have nothing to do with an virus that I don't know anything about, I'm, I'm apart from this process. I can sit and tell you what I think. But if you told me to bring in one of my favorite photographs, and then you had the class do this project on my work, mm -hmm. then I would suddenly be like, oh, Crap, I can see how this can be interpreted or misinterpreted. And I, I think it, then you might get your buy in. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, and then to piggyback on that, I might say if they understand how this would impact them professionally, why are they in the class? Um, and why does sitting here looking at that right. and getting that feedback help them learn or contributing to the scalar site? Great, I helped you work on a scalar site, it doesn't matter. but. How will that translate into me running a museum or being a photographer or something else? Right. So right. finding those connections, I think, are important. Yeah, I think um, I answered that question a little bit. Too. I like the idea of having them bring in their own work and then having them be panicked by what we might read into it. Um, um, but I also I, I would answer that by saying um, no artist wants their work to be re read in a singular way. Right? And so, um, by no, no work of art has a single meaning. If it did, then it would be illustration. And so, I think that the, there is um, a way in which getting, maybe using your exercise to get them to read multiple levels of multiple interpretations into a work would be equally interesting. I wonder, was the assignment? Because the way you're describing what they're doing to me perfectly comes, it's sort of like they're explaining it as opposed to arguing for it or, or marshaling evidence to convince mm -hmm. you of one of those interpretations. Yeah. But, but that's my yeah. question. Is that, is yeah. That no, every, you know, go back to the, the assignment for this, which was who made whom, right? Mm -hmm. They had to make an argument about it. And, yeah. But yet they weren't fine pulling no, together the pieces. No. Of the yeah. Well, no, some did. I mean, I make them sound like they didn't do a great job. They did a great job <laughs> in the class. But, these, but this, there was this level of like getting deeper into the research, mm -hmm. right? And, and making an argument that seemed to be, to be a challenge for us. Um, okay, so lots of thoughts that I'll take back and I saw you're taking notes too. That's great. Um, there was one other part to this class. I'll just say it real quickly and then I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Jocelyn. Um, we did hold a conference um, in relationship to the class uh, because we were TIGA funded and um, it was called Teaching Visuality. Not teaching the visual, not teaching you know, how to make a visual work of art, but teaching visuality because we liked activating that term. And um, we brought together um, about 15 to 20 faculty and museum staff uh, from throughout the colleges to talk about how they teach vi visuality from a multiple of different disciplines, um, perspectives, um, sci and, and um, they were scientific, they were in the humanities, they were in the arts, and in the social sciences. Uh, the first night was a panel discussion with the consultants that we had uh, working with us on creating the class and team teaching, uh, guest lecturing in the class. And uh, with the attendees on questions of duration in teaching. 
And it was really important to tell you about when do you teach fast and when do you teach slow and, and with people from all these different disciplines. And when does technology facilitate teaching fast and teaching slow and when does um, technology not help teaching fast and teaching slow and when do, how, when do we learn to teach fast and slow or use fast and slow methods of looking as individuals but also as a community. Um, and I was really happy to have um, <coughs> Krista Harper from UMass <coughs> to talk about the community um, perspectives of that. Then the second day, uh, we had a faculty volunteer to come in and present for five minutes on one word that related to how they taught um, visuality. This is uh, Katja uh, Bren Brenagic, I think is how you say her name, from Hampshire. Um, uh, who teaches physics and talked about the question of perspective, which was really interesting to me because I, as an art historian, I hear the word perspective and I immediately think of scientific perspective or one point perspective. Uh, but for her, it was completely different. And the words were things like forensics, density, ephemerality, um, all for five minutes. And then people broke into groups and talked about like what, what worked for them in this, what did they learn from each other. So it was really fun to take this idea of slow teaching out of art history and put it into the context of multiple disciplines. Um, okay, great. So Jocelyn is actually a curator uh, working um, with um, at Hampshire on a couple of different projects with me. And she's going to talk about some of the curatorial assignments that were related to this course, but also to another project that we work on together. Yeah, so um, I came into this course um, uh, halfway through the, the process, so um, after classes had, had started, but um, uh, not during the sort of preparation phase. So um, uh, and I'm sort of helping sort of patch some things in Scalar itself, um, but then also sort of um, being a, a witness to the course and a, a research for students as they work on their own projects. Um, so I uh, am a curator and I'm interested in um, the sort of newish, I would say, proliferation of curatorial projects and courses. Um, uh, so this course reading project, we've had two curatorial assignments, um, and then on the final project, I've had an optional curatorial um, assignment. Um, I'm curious if anyone in the class has supported a course or taught a course with a curatorial component. Yeah? Um, does anyone uh, think of themselves as a curator or one who curates things? You? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I asked probably because the word um, curate has sort of expanded um, a lot in the past decade or so. Um, it means lots of things in lots of different contexts. So um, I think it has a particular meaning in a museum context, um, another meaning perhaps in your Spotify account, um, a different meaning in uh, like interior design and like lifestyle um, uh, retail stores. Um, Blue Apron curates food for you. It's like in their marketing that they're curators of food. Um, and so I think. Um, the, perhaps the kinds of activities that the word curate now is an umbrella for are different, um, but I do think it, it always suggests some level of expertise, um, and sometimes that comes from passion, sometimes that comes from education, um, and sometimes that comes from sort of networking being in the know. Um, but I do think even even one who curates your living room, they're they're curating from a, a point of expertise, which I think is sort of important to at least give credence to, even if you're skeptical of um, <laughs> where the word curate is going. Um, and I, I think. Um, you know, there's a sort of familiar story now about how we have a lot of data points now, a lot of you know, too many images, too many things to sort of sort through, and so curation is a strategy to um, point attention in particular places in different ways. Um, I think this is familiar enough that we don't have to talk that much more about it. Um, I would say maybe sort of generally, um, and maybe that this is sort of my bias coming from a museum and gallery perspective, um, the work of curating is building connections between ideas things, people, and places. Um, and the ambition is that those connections be meaningful, um, but often they aren't, right? <laughs> I think uh, um, curating in a space is very different from curating online or curating in a digital space. Um, you know, I think curating in a space, um, you sort of have to sort of pay attention to the everyday sort of activities of a material museum, which might be particularly boring. So like paperwork and loans and climate control and um, getting stuff on a wall without defining the rules of gravity. Um, uh, but in that context, I do think that, that space is usually the medium of the curator. 
right? So you're paying attention to how the space is lit. You're paying attention to how a visitor enters a room and how they encounter a work of art, how they move between one work. Again, I have a bias of an art curator. Um, how they sort of um, encounter one work in relation to another and how they move through a space. Um, you're sort of attentive to the sounds of the space, of, of maybe the sound of footfall or sort of echoes that are sort of accidental, but then also like an intentional sound from the space. Um, and so I think uh, the, the, the grammar of curating um, in, in a museum or in a gallery is often spatial, right? Um, and it's, it's the, the way in which you pay attention to those spatial dynamics is where sort of meaningful connections can be made. Um, I think curating online is really different. Um, uh, in, in the kinds of activities that it, it can support. So I just have a, a long list of words um, that I thought I would share. So I think I'm curating online, and, and I think maybe specifically in the platforms that a lot of folks are using to um, support digital curating in classrooms, so um, WordPress, Emeka, and Scalar. Um, I think these are the kinds of activities that those platforms can support. Um, so ordering, sequencing, comparing, grouping, gathering, choosing, networking, Circulating, copying, indexing, tagging, linking, uh, and downloading. Um, I think those are the behaviors that are sort of natural to those platforms. It's not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but I think it's um, it's one that's, that's I think is um, different enough from the kinds of things that we think about in, in sort of spatial material curating that they're worth paying attention to. Um, and they're they're absolutely I think natural to those platforms like uh, WordPress and Scalar. Um, and maybe also it's just sort of natural to the web as a whole. Um, I think one, one thing I'm sort of interested in, in thinking through is um, uh, sort of moving away from equivalencies, so moving away from um, sort of one image after another um, in digital curating and um, thinking more seriously about differences in distances. Um, so I think because of the way that um, browser supports specific kinds of scrolling, because of the ways that you sort of attune yourself to certain kinds of seeing on the web, um, we're often sort of looking at equivalences um, and, and sort of at one image next to another, I'm sort of I'm thinking of them as sort of um, ontologically the same. Um, and I'm sort of maybe more interested in thinking about how we can teach to curate online um, in a way that privileges differences and distances. Um, um, so I think um, a lot of the, um, the curatorial assignments in, in classes, and again, these are in art history classes, in history classes, public history, literature, um, area studies courses. Um, I think there are a few science classes in here that are um, asking students to curate as well exhibitions. Um, um, often the assignment is to put some group of things into dialogue and conversation. Um, and I think it's often presented as um, a mode of, of research or a methodology of looking um, that um, uses the, the sort of the um, the, uh, the question of how you can put something into a dialogue um, as a, a, a way to support and, and encourage a specific kind of research. So I think in some ways it, it's um, become a strategy to move away from the sort of formal analysis and towards thinking about um, an object or an image that has its own context and its own history in conversation with other objects that have their own their own context and their own history, and then how sort of new meaning comes from all those different conversations together. Um, I think I won't try to show some of the examples just because they're on this computer and we're running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> but um, just um, I'll read out loud what the assignment was for the curatorial um, assignment with the, um, the Douglas photograph. So um, Karen and Jennifer provided the students with an image gallery on Scalar. Um, and um, they asked the students to put Samuel J. Miller's daguerreotype portrait of Frederick Douglass into dialogue in at least five of the comp comparative images using the readings as a theoretical lens. This is in bold. Using the readings as a theoretical lens, make an argument about portraiture and social class. Um, so uh, I think the, the, the dream <laughs> is that the outcome will be um, not simply um, a group of photographs that have um, sitters in profile, and you can sort of, and, and the argument is not sitters in profile have this sort of, um, like sit in this way, right? It's, it's sort of it's not about um, uh, sort of like a formal re repetition across objects and images, um, but a reading of these images that requires a student to understand um, an individual photograph, um, uh, a collection of photographs uh, and their own histories, and also how they work together, right? So it's, it's um, 
and it has a low efficacy of CBC disease for like three levels of, um, of research in Um I think the challenge in this particular context for this class um, was um, something that we I think, already talked about, sort of how, how to get students to make that leap. Um, but I think also just sort of technologically, um, the scalar, for the most part, maybe aside from the annotation component, the scalar was the vehicle that paced the course, right? It sort of set out um, the temporality of the course, and it wasn't necessarily um, the goal of the course that students work with scalar beyond using scalar as, as a sort of timekeeping mechanism, right? So it's, it's the thing that sets the pace, um, but not the thing that students are using to, to build new work. Um, so students weren't authors of the scalar sites, um, and therefore we had to sort of mess around with where these peers were, or projects could live if the sort of original um, images were in the scalar, then what do students do with them and how and what about that work? Mm -hmm. um, so we moved the, those projects onto Moodle because we didn't want the students to have authorship of the scalar site, quite frankly, because we were panicked mm -hmm. about what would happen to material that was on there. Right? So and and we weren't we they were either all or nothing. We couldn't um, we couldn't um, give them authorship. This was a problem with scalar. They couldn't have authorship for parts. Right? It had to be either the whole site or nothing. Um, so I think we'll just wrap up super quickly mm -hmm. with um, just to, to point out another project that Karen and I are working on that actually starts in uh, approximately 10 days um, mm -hmm. called the Institute for Curious Photo Practice. Um, we're entering our fourth summer. Um, it's um, similar to reading photography in that um, the structure of the program um, uses one organizing object in the five college art collections um, as a catalyst for thinking about um, uh, what and exhibitions can be, essentially. Um, so students come into the program, um, they work with this one organizing object throughout five weeks. Um, they uh, learn um, a lot of different um, histories and uh, contemporary practices of, of curating. Um, they go to a lot of different museums, uh, both in the five colleges and um, sort of more broadly, um, uh, and, and think sort of theoretically about what curious art practice is. Um, all sort of grounded in this in this one organizing object to imagine what an exhibition could could be that sort of springs from this object. Mm -hmm. um, it's very different from reading photography in that it's um, relentless in its pace, uh, and I don't think we ever ask anyone to slow down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so and the students come from all over the country, I should say, and they're at all levels. They're all either undergraduates, post BA, or graduate students. Um, we've uh, tended to use WordPress as our primary platform of, of digital curating. Um, Hampshire IT has been um, uh, really quite open, I think, in terms of um, what kind of access students have um, in creating WordPress sites that um, they have a lot of, of authorship over. So, um, you know, we have a, a limited set of themes, but students can switch between themes once they have a site set up. Um, we have a fair amount of plugins, we have CSS access. Um, and uh, I think if we um, uh, sort of we need plugins from themes and they don't muck with the entire system, then they're sort of very generous in supporting that. Um, at the same time, I think we've become frustrated that um, uh, because of the limitations of WordPress and the sort of expectations of what WordPress does, and I think it goes back to this idea of um, uh, you know ordering, sequencing, comparing, grouping these, these sort of activities that online curating tends to. to, to um, navigate towards. Um, we've been a little frustrated that maybe the exhibitions have started to look the same and started to act the same. Um, uh, so in addition to, to these WordPress sites, we've also in the past had students carry it for a group projection gallery in Hampshire, um, and I think this summer we'll ask them to um, also carry it for, for another kind of projection gallery, but then also possibly um, a radio broadcast um, system at Hampshire that um, broadcasts visually. Um, and so just sort of imagine what an exhibition with images could look like. Um, uh, and then maybe I was playing around with, with a, a brand new virtual reality day, right? Yes, you're right. So maybe it was from here. Um, so um, maybe I'll just show one image. Yeah, show you one image. And then maybe one later one. Mm -hmm. So um, it wasn't an accident that. I chose the Adrian Piper for our class. Um, 
because I actually chose Adrian Piper, that Adrian Piper piece for an organizing object for the first summer of the Institute for Curatorial Practice, precisely because I felt it could go in so many different directions. It could be for the students who want to work more conventionally in art history. It could simply be a mother and child. For students who were curious about working with appropriation, it could uh, become a piece, uh, piece, uh, uh, a piece of an exhibition, a digital exhibition, that dealt with appropriation. And so one group of students, they have to work in groups, they have to figure out how to get along and make an exhibition together, which is very similar to real world curating. So. Um, so, so this is a group of students that's interested in appropriation and especially in um, the way that curatorial functions are appropriated by artists and, and vice versa. Um, so they have um, uh, a gallery with different kinds of um, groupings. Um, we, we expect uh, generally um, uh, an attention to images as well as to um, to text. Um, so they all have you know scholarly essays attached to them, mm -hmm. um, and each book, each exhibition will sort of um, navigate between image and text differently. Um, this is a more recent one. We also have a, a paid internship program um, that follows the, the ICP. Um, so this is an exhibition that was produced um, during one of those internships with the Need Art Museum at Amherst College. Um, uh, working specifically with um, super old textiles from South America, one from 200 uh, BC and one from 600 CE, um, that are very difficult to display, partly because of their fragility, but also um, uh, just because they're, they're, they're quite small and sort of they, they get lost in, in um, material exhibition spaces. Um, and so uh, this intern um, used those fragments, um, had super high res um, images of those fragments so that people could look at them closely, um, and then also put them in four radically different curatorial contexts to sort of um, uh, investigate the, the ways in which um, these kinds of artists can be instrumentalized for different kinds of arguments in, in curatorial contexts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we put um, the collections of the five college museums. There's actually 10 museums uh, in the five college area. We put their collections in dialogue with each other in a digital space because it can't happen uh, in real space. Uh, and we also look for ways to use the digital to expose things about objects that you wouldn't see necessarily. But I'm afraid we had much more, but I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, and I thank you so much for your uh, comments. I think that they'll be really helpful for us when we choose the course of so, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.